Hi Church, welcome back to our online service right here at Every Nation Singapore. Let's open our hearts to God and to His Word even as we start this service. I want to share a verse taken from Jeremiah chapter 1. The Word came to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. And this is what God says to Jeremiah. Before I form you in the womb, I knew you. Now pause for a moment here. If you are here listening and at some time you are thinking that nobody really understand me, nobody really knows my struggle, nobody really understand me. You know what loneliness is? Loneliness is you do not understand what it feels to be in my shoe, to be like me. I want to take this opportunity to tell you there's one person who knows you who knows you inside out, who knows your emotion, your strength and your tendency, your weaknesses, because He made you and that is God. God knows you and He calls you by name. And the verse goes on to say that before you were born, I set you apart. We are set apart. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. God has set us apart. And He says, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That is to Jeremiah. I do not know what your calling is, but I'm here to tell you that God has given you a God-given purpose, a God-given calling. And it is a purpose and calling that only you can fulfill. Now you may sit there and think, ah, I might have missed my calling. I might have missed the opportunity because of some bad decisions I've made. You know, God's calling is irrevocable or you are there sitting and say God I do not know what my purpose is what my calling is would you come before God today and ask him God what have you called me to what have what is my calling in life what is my God-given portion here on this earth you are not here to fight for oxygen with one another you are not here to take up space or just run the rat race God has given us a purpose and a calling Would you join me even as we pray over this verse? Father, I thank you that more than anyone else, there is you who know us. You are the great high priest who empathizes with us. You are the great high priest who knows us and you have made us. You are our creator. You alone know us inside out better than we know ourselves. God, I pray for anyone that is feeling a sense of loneliness, that God, would your presence come upon them and then be with them. And God, would you help us to understand that we are set apart. Our, our purpose, our end goal is not here on this earth to just chase after the numbers and, and run the rat race. But our purpose here is to glorify you. Would you give us that sense of purpose today? Our calling, God, I thank you that your calling is irrevocable. But would you bring clarity to each and every one of us, what you have called us to do, that we will live a God-given purpose and a fulfilled life. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to pass the time over to Pastor Josh for the good word. Pastor Josh, over to you. Hey everybody, Pastor Josh back. We're continuing through the book of Matthew and I've really loved diving into the word of God. Uh, hearing the stories of Jesus, hearing the things Jesus actually said and taught and how they can affect our life today. And that's one of our responsibilities, right? He's going to be discussing some and, and actually rebuking some people today as we journey through Matthew chapter 23. And I think rather than just judge other people and go, wow, those Pharisees or those other guys, man, they had issues. I think we want to look with a lens and look in a mirror, maybe let God's word be a mirror to us and go, Lord, speak to me as we read your word about who I am and how you're making me to be more like you. And so Jesus is speaking and he's speaking both to his disciples and now he's saying this to the multitude. So this is a a principle, an idea that carries with it um, weight and value to anybody. He says, the scribes and Pharisees sit at Moses' seat. In other words, they have positional authority. There's certain sphere of influence where they're in charge. If you're in the synagogue, they're kind of running it. So he says, whatever they tell you to do, uh, to observe, that observe and do. Do we follow positional authority? Yes. Do we have to agree with it all the time? No. What if positional authority challenges us to do something that's outside of our moral framework or compass? 
that's when you have to make really hard decisions. Uh, you can read Diedrich Bonhoeffer, you can read uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and some of the wrestling they did with, how do I n- navigate obeying authority when that authority doesn't necessarily align to godly principles, okay? Now, as much as possible, we just obey. So like, if, if Singapore has certain rules uh, that they say follow this way, like for example, I'm from America, I'm not from a former British Commonwealth, so I tend to walk on the opposite side of the road of everybody else. Well, if they tell me to walk on this side, not that side, I need to adjust, okay? It's on me to adjust uh, to the commands of the community I live in, unless it's a moral issue where God's law is very clear and I can't submit to that, okay? But in this case, he's saying, look, they tell you to do something, they tell you to wear a certain coat, sit in a certain place, act a certain way, just sit there and do it. But, and this is a huge but, uh, that's my insert joke here, big but, right? Uh, Do not do according to their works. So he's separating, submitting to their commands because they're in charge positionally in a certain area. He's saying that, Okay, you have to submit to, but don't be like them because here's the problem with what they do. They say things, but they don't do what they're saying. Here's how they act. They tend to bind heavy burdens. In other words, they tell you to do a lot of things. Hey, if you're really going to be a follower of God, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do the other. And the things they're telling you to do are pretty hard to bear. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. I was picturing this because I remember I used to uh, go to the gym with a guy and when we were lifting, if I was starting to burn out and I would start to, oh, it's too much for me and I can't lift any longer, I would get about here and start burning out. He would put one finger on the bar and see if he could, you know, that little bit would help me. And even one finger sometimes helps. A lot of times it didn't. A lot of times I was burned out anyway. But the idea is these guys tell you to lift a lot of stuff, be very moral, do good things, never make mistakes, but they don't actually help you live differently. Uh, It goes on to say this about them, and I find this pretty funny. All their works, they do to be seen by people. I don't know if you've ever seen, I walked across a couple guys and they were taking pictures in front of this beautiful Mercedes Benz, and I realized after a little bit, it wasn't their Mercedes Benz. They were posing, acting like it was their car. They were looking, acting like, hey, look at me, look how prosperous I am. You too can make big bucks like me. The only problem was it wasn't even really their car. They like to be seen looking good, but the substance isn't necessarily there. Goes on to say, they make phylacrities broad and enlarge the borders of their garment. I I had to look this up. Honestly, I didn't understand what a phylacrity exactly was. It's this little box and a string, and you wrap it around maybe around your, it can be by your head, it can be on your shoulder, it can be on your arm, and it has within it actually the law of God. And the idea was to literally put the word of God, bind it around your arm, bind it around your heart, Uh, These are references to Old Testament scriptures where literally putting the word of God on you to remember to live the word of God. Now, that doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. It's not necessarily that these things they're doing are wrong. To, To keep the word of God physically on their person to remind them to obey the law is not a bad thing. Uh, The borders of their garments have to do with their roles and positions and responsibilities. These things, they like to look good. The problem with it wasn't the, the physical things they're doing, the problem was the, the reason behind why they do what they do. And I think this is so huge for us to remember. Jesus is always looking at our heart. God is always looking at our heart and going, why are you doing what you're doing? Not just what are you doing, why are you doing what you're doing? He goes on to say this, they love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace. I have some friends who hate sitting in the front row of church ever because the, this verse They're scared to be, oh, am I sitting in the best seat? I don't want to sit in the best seat. I think we need to be careful about thinking we're owed position. Or uh, Nani and I were recently at Victory Church's celebration of their 40 years in the Philippines and all the growth and all the blessing. And we were kind of allowed to sit in the group of the leaders who really built this thing. And we were looking at each other like, why are we here? We shouldn't be in these, you know, on the ground level with the important people when we were only a very, very, very small part of all this. And I think that's the right position to be in is, hey, none of this is owed to us. We shouldn't be hungry to be up front. We shouldn't be hungry to be looked at or seen by people. Now, if people want to bless us, that's great. Don't be weird and and falsely humble and unable to receive blessing. But I do think we want to be cautious. Uh, And it says this, they love to be called rabbi, rabbi. Uh, Just a personal story really quick. When I went to... um, the School of World Mission in 2005, part of our, our church movement, Every Nation, uh, I got the nickname Rabbi in part because I think I was the only guy with a beard 
and in part because I had a little bit of Bible training in my background, some of my, my degrees from uh, secular college. And so they start calling me rabbi. Every time they did, I would think about this verse. You do not be called rabbi. So I was like, okay, wait, maybe I need to stop this. I'm getting a little nervous. I'm not supposed to be called rabbi. Why are we not supposed to be called rabbi? For one is your teacher, the Christ. Now, does that mean don't teach? I, I, hopefully I'm teaching something right now by the grace of God, by the anointing, the Christ, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit through Jesus into us. We teach one another, but we have to remember we are all brothers and sisters. We're not special to one another. You know, sometimes we think of pastors as, oh, they're the shepherds, but they're sheep who are shepherding. We're still sheep. We're still brothers and sisters. We're not getting the extra special better than everybody else treatment. Jesus is the only different one. And he's empowering us to live differently. So we need to remember, hey, if somebody's calling me rabbi or teacher or going, wow, that guy's such a great teacher or great evangelist or great whatever word he's using, to pull ourselves back and remember, ultimately, it's Jesus who's the one who empowers any of that. And so he's warning these leaders because he's like, it's easy when you're in a leadership position and people are looking up to you to believe how they feel about you. But the truth is they don't really know you. I remember I was talking to a young man recently. He was like, I think I always thought pastors were different types of human beings. They weren't real. Uh, they had some kind of special lifestyle where they didn't actually have problems and they always knew what the Bible said and they always were praying all the time. And then I got around pastors and found out they're human beings. <laughs> and so we need to remember the power, the, 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 the weightiness of our leadership, the value of our leadership ultimately comes from God himself through Jesus to us. So he says, do not call anyone even your father for one is your father he who is in heaven. Now, again, my kids call me dad. I don't think that's a problem. I'm not saying you can't be confused who your physical biological father is. I think, again, these are reminders from Jesus to see ourselves in our different positions. As a father, I might think I'm under a burden to protect, provide, bring peace, bring everything to my children. And I am very limited in that ability. But God is unlimited in that ability. So God as father is fully providing, fully protecting, fully bringing purpose fully bringing peace. We're a small piece of partnering with that in people's lives, in my case, in my children's lives, to reflect the Father's image in our fathering of others. So he goes on to again say, don't be called teacher for one is your teacher, the Christ. And then he goes on to say this, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And this is the upside down nature of God's kingdom. The truth is the world's upside down. We think whoever's pushing everyone else down to rise up is at the highest position. Whoever can compete and fight and get you know, social Darwinism, fight for your own and survival of the fittest, that's an upside down world that God never meant for it to exist that way. A right side up world is how Jesus lived. Whoever's the greatest among you shall be your servant. So what is our response to that? Whoever then exalts themselves, God will humble. Whoever humbles themselves, God will exalt. I love that idea. The more we're trying to push ourselves forward, God will actually stand against us and bring us back down. The more we're trying to humble ourselves, and, and what does humility really mean? I think C.S. Lewis and others did a great job of explaining this, uh, framing it as humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. So what's the difference? It's not going, oh, I'm so worthless, I'm so pitiful, I have no value. That's not humility. That's actually a lie because Jesus died on a cross for your sins. He rose from the dead to give you new life. That means he thinks you're so valuable, he's willing to die for you. So you do have value. You do have purpose. Uh, you do have an essential value to yourself that God sees and honors. However, true humility goes, it's not about me. It's about Mike behind the camera becoming everything God's calling him to be. It's about our staff being healthy. It's about the members who come to our church being healthy. It's about our children. It's about my wife. It's about everyone around me. And if I get focused on them thinking about myself less, not thinking less of myself, then God will put me in positions to serve and help other people. Because if you think about being exalted or being raised to leadership, the reason God puts people in leadership is not for those people, it's for them to help other people. We're following Jesus and then having him help us help others follow him. So any leadership position we get is not for ourselves; it's to help others. Now he switches gears and I'm just gonna warn you, I'm gonna go through a bunch of verses where he is speaking, whoa, like, whoa. 
and not woe in like, wow, that's so cool, but woe in like, there is a problem, there is a, a danger of a curse coming upon you. And so he, we're just gonna run through a lot of these and what happens when people who are supposed to be leading in a way that involves humility, thinking about yourself less and thinking more about others, people who are supposed to be leading in a way where the greatest will be the servant who are actually getting other people to serve them, he begins to speak uh, promises of judgment on them. And so let's run through these together, not to judge the people he's talking to, but to guard our own heart, to judge our own heart and allow God to heal us if any of these behaviors or mindsets have been creeping in to our lives. So he says, woe to you, scri uh, Pharisees, scribes, hypocrites. You're already under judgment. Why? You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men for you neither go in yourself nor do you allow those who are entering in to go in. In other words, God starts moving and you go, well, they're not moving the way we like to do it. They're not wearing the clothes we want them to wear. Uh, if you've seen the movie, Jesus a Revolution or, or walk through the Jesus movement of the 70s, you'd know that a lot of churches shut their doors to people because they didn't dress the way we wanted them to dress or cut their hair the way we wanted them to cut their hair. And he's saying, hey, don't do that. Who are we rejecting in our communities because of how they look? Who's trying to get to God, but they're doing it in a way that's uncomfortable for us, and so we're not willing to open our doors? Let's not be those people. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You devour widows' houses for a pretense, make long prayers, and therefore you will receive greater condemnation. They were willing to receive gifts from widows who didn't have much money and pray for them long in front of everyone, but not actually get out somewhere and help somebody. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, get one person to convert to you. When they're one, you make them twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Okay, he's getting serious all of a sudden. Woe to you, blind guides, who say whoever swears by the temple, is, it is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he's obliged to perform it. They care about the money, not about the worship of God. And he says that makes you blind. So these are people trying to lead others who don't actually see themselves. Fools and blind. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar is nothing. Whoever swears by the gift that on it, he's obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. Which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Do you know their answer was actually, as long as we get the gift, we're happy. And some people are like that. As long as the money comes in, as long as the material goods come in, we're good. I think that's not God's heart. God's heart would be this. Do we really honor, reverence, and recognize the value of God's presence, the worship of God, his power, his goodness? And should we be shepherding just resources coming in or should we be looking for shepherding, honoring, guarding the presence of God being on everything we do? And my appeal to you would be this. The most important thing to figure out is Jesus, what could I do in this moment that would help your presence remain upon us, your peace remain upon us, that we would rightly represent your kingdom in what we're about to do? Resource can come from anywhere. God can provide resource. But is my heart set right before him or am I focused on the things he could provide rather than God himself? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and all the things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and all the, the, by him who dwells in it. That means God. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. In other words, be careful. You might be saying, you know, God is my witness or I swear to God. Be very careful to honor the God who you're appealing to. And in my case, I represent, if you're someone who says, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who, who, who represents Jesus on the earth, are my attitudes and actions genuinely representing him? Are my words faithful to the words of Jesus? The truth is sometimes the answer for me is not. So guard my heart. Lord, help me speak. May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight because you're our rock, you're our redeemer. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. So imagine this, right? One, the first of every 10 things you get is God's. So they have these little tiny seeds and they're cutting the first one going, that one's God's, nine for me. Next one's God's, nine for me. Next one's God's, nine for me. These little tiny, you can't even see them specks of seeds. And they're so faithful to make sure they don't break the law that they're cutting those little one tiny pieces out. Yet they're neglecting the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. 
And I love how Jesus frames that. It's such a balanced approach. He says, these you ought to have done. In other words, hey, no problem with the tithe. Abraham started the tithe. The tithe was by faith. The tithe was a recognition of a covenant of blessing between us and God. And he was gonna bless us and make us a blessing to all nations, so wonderful. But don't leave the other more important things undone. Hey, God, I gave you a tithe. Now, I didn't act, I acted unjustly to everyone around me. And I showed no mercy to those who were in need. And I in no way showed your love or your grace or your goodness in any of my behaviors, but I followed the rules. You know, it's easier to do the rules that don't require relationship. It's easier to do the rules that don't require me caring for other people. Uh, It gets messy when you jump into other people's lives. It is so much easier for me to just go, I don't do bad things, than for me to actually engage with people who need help. But Jesus looks at that and goes, blind guides. You're straining at a gnat. That's a little gnat flypaper thing next to a plant, and you barely can see these little black dots. Those are tiny little gnats, and they're making sure they catch all the gnats, and then it says they're swallowing a camel. Camels are bigger than us. Imagine you're, you're swallowing something that actually is going to explode your whole body while straining out these tiny little microscopic things. He says, woe to you. Don't be so worried about not doing these little tiny things that don't ultimately matter, and then you're failing to do these huge things that are going to actually kind of set the course for your entire life. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside, extortion and self-indulgence. I look good to you guys, but it's actually all about me. Uh, Anyone ever been in a marriage moment knows this. You start acting right on the outside, but the person can tell you're doing it transactionally. Hey, I'm loving you this way because I want to get from you. See, I did this nice thing for you as my wife, or I did this nice thing for you as my kids, or I did this nice thing for you as my members of our church, or I did this nice thing for my pastor, but it's so that I can get something. You remember James and John's mom? Hey, Jesus, you know I've been supporting your ministry a lot, right? I just, just to be clear, are you cool if James and John sit on your left and right hand when you come into your kingdom? Be careful about giving blessings that have hooks attached. I don't think that's God's heart for anybody. Hey, I'm giving you this thing, but it's extortion. I give you $100 now, but I'm going to demand of you $1,000 later. Those are loan sharks, not friends or Christians, okay? Extortion, self-indulgence. I'm doing this nice thing for you so I can get something back for myself so I can feed my own flesh. Blind Pharisee. First, cleanse the inside of the cup and dish. They're really talking about our heart, okay? They're not worried about cup and dish alone. They're talking about inside my heart that the outside of them may be clean also. You know, if you get your heart right, your actions start following that. And that's exactly what the Bible says, guard your heart, because out of it flow the issues of life. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. Indeed, you appear nice outwardly, but inside you're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside, hypocrisy, lawlessness. God wants to heal us from the inside out. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You build tombs of the prophets, adorn the monuments of the righteous, and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. In other words, we wouldn't have made the mistakes all those other religious people made. We wouldn't do the bad things other religious people have done in history. And he goes, you're witnesses against yourself, that you're the sons of the very people who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Jesus is about to lose it. Serpents, he doesn't really lose it, but he gets intense right here. Serpents, children of vipers. This is a a reference all the way back to Genesis saying, you're like the serpent who's a deceiver and a corrupter and a condemner. How can you escape condemnation of hell if you're condemning others? These are strong words from Jesus. And again, I don't want us to read them in any way thinking about, yeah, those guys back then were bad or that guy over there is bad or I know someone like that. I don't think that's how he's writing these scriptures. I think we're seeing these scriptures as mirrors to go, Lord, is there anything in me where I'm functioning in extortion or self-indulgence? Is there anything in me where I care more about the externals, the outside of my cup, more than my heart and my inside and the reality of who who you are in me, what you're doing in me, and who you're making me to be? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, scribes, some of you... Uh, Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. I like this verse for this reason. 
we just had about almost 20 verses of Jesus condemning these guys. But what is his actual answer? I send you prophets. I send you wise people. I send you as many people as I can to try to help pull you back onto the right path, to help you understand the word of God, to help you hear what the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you. Yet you're gonna still persecute them, but I'm still gonna send them. I'm gonna try everything I can to help you. Uh, You may come, uh, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. So he's, he's going back in the Old Testament going, you guys know this. There's righteous people again and again and again who were condemned, persecuted, murdered because of their righteousness. And he's telling their story. And then he says, I assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. He's saying, look, I showed up. I'm the fulfillment. Jesus, not Josh Harris. Jesus showed up. He's the fulfillment of everything you've read about your whole life. And if you don't understand that now, you're going to miss your moment. Here's the compassion of God. He's warned them. He's tried every way he could think of. He's been healing people. He's been multiplying bread. He's been showing his goodness everywhere he goes. He's been teaching. And we're getting towards the end of his ministry. And finally, he, he tries the area of correction and rebuke here and says, hey, guys, warning you, warning you, warning you, warning you. And now you hear the heart of a savior whose people are rejecting him when he cries out, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you're the one who kills prophets and stones the ones that are sent to you. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But here's the really sad point. You were not willing. I'm here. I'm I'm offering help. And this is our God. He's not telling us we have this hypocrisy because he just wants to condemn us. He's not telling us we're going down the wrong path just to tell us we're going down the wrong path. He's trying to get us back on the right path. And he says, now look around you and see, your house has left you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, here's a cool thing. That's where it kind of ends. But Jesus is actually ending this discourse with the scribes and Pharisees with an angle of hope, because he's saying, hey, you're desolate until I come. He's about to come. Those very words are about to be sung to him. We call it Palm Sunday. And so as he enters into that, he's saying, look, despite everything you've done, I'm still coming to help you. In fact, the plan for me to come and help you has been in effect for a very long time. We can go all the way back to Genesis, but let's just go back to Isaiah and see what Isaiah said about it. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be as wool. How? How was all this hypocrisy? How was all these dead men's bones and extortion and self-indulgence and swallowing camels and all this stuff? How was it going to be all washed away? Because Jesus was going to come and live the life we were supposed to live. Jesus is coming and he's dying the death we deserve to die. Jesus is rising from the dead to show he had conquered those sins, conquered that death, and he could offer you that same resurrection life. You go, I've blown my whole life. Talked to a guy the other day, and he he, he referenced the number of years he's been alive and said, you know, that 40 plus years I've been alive and, and I see no value in it. Jesus can come in your 50th year, 60th year, 70th year. At 79 years old, Moses had spent 39 years shepherding somebody else's sheep in the middle of the desert and he had murdered somebody. That was his career CV. But God at 80 can touch him and change his whole life. Paul, when he's Saul of Tarsus, again, checking the resume, uh, I, I, I throw children and women in prison. Uh, I hunt people down and persecute them and approve of them being murdered. But the Holy Spirit touches him. Jesus arrives and shows him who he is. A brother named Ananias lays hands on him and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And that same man's whole life is turned completely upside down, really turned right back, right side up. Though your sins were as scarlet, they should be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, and that's our part, what do we offer God? We offer him our yes. You will eat the good of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you're gonna be devoured by the sword. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. He's given us two choices. Will we follow him? Will we follow the door he's opened? He is the way. He is truth. He is life. Jesus is leading us to life. Or will we resist and rebel? So how do we follow Jesus in the way he's calling us to? First of all, it's a heart thing. He's told us it's not about position. It's not about fame. It's definitely not for show. He's looking into our heart and seeing what the genuineness of our faith looks like, the genuineness of our life looks like. The reality is if you're like me, there's a mixed bag in there nasty stuff that I'm embarrassed of, wonderful stuff that God's doing in my life. I need a savior to save me. 
How do I do it? I find humility, the humility that comes from Jesus, that the greatness is actually in the serving. That if I'll exalt myself, he's gonna humble me. But if I'll humble myself, he will exalt me. If I recognize, I love the story where a guy's praying and going, thank God I'm not like those bad people. Man, I don't do the bad things they do and I do the good stuff. I fast, I pray, I give a little bit of money here and there. Aren't I great? And God says, that guy goes away not justified before God. But there was another guy who knew he was wicked and he sat at the back and, and I love King James Version says he beat on his breast. He's, he's pounding his chest and going, God have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. God says that man went away justified because he recognized he needed help. So from our heart, coming to God and saying, God, I need help. God, I need you to lead me. I need you to guide me. And the good news is there's hope because if we have willingness, if we're willing to obey by faith and say, yes, we will go where you say to go, do what you say to do, say what you say to say. And how? Because your spirit, Jesus working for us, what he's already done on the cross, what he currently does by living to make intercession for us, how he sends his Holy Spirit to change us, to shift us, to empower us by his grace to even live differently, that that willingness and that obedience ultimately come through God showing himself to us. As we say yes to that, he fills us with the power to say yes, fills us with the power to want what we should want and stop wanting the things we don't want. All of this work comes ultimately from Jesus. And that's why as we close our time together, we always remind us to celebrate by taking communion. Um, again, this is normally a practice done in community. It could be a small group, could be a family, could be your spouse, could be just a friend. Um, can you take it by yourself? I have before just because I take it as a remembrance of Jesus's work. He says, as long as you take your bread, you remember his body broken for you. You take a cup in remembrance of his blood that was shed to forgive your sins. So as we close our time together, we wanna to just celebrate, and I'm gonna pray for us, uh, that we celebrate the work of Jesus that can change us from the inside out, change our heart, fill us with humility, empower us by his grace to follow him in the living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So Father, I thank you that Jesus came and he lived a perfect life and he died a sacrificial death and he rose from the dead. And now he's looking at us going, hey, if your heart, is broken, I can heal it. If your heart uh, is filled with dirt and hypocrisy and, and brokenness and selfishness, I can take all that out and give you a new heart, a heart that's tender, a heart that's filled with my word and life. If you're full of pride or you're full of fear, I can take all that out and fill you with a humility that doesn't even worry about yourself or focus on yourself. It turns all your attention to God. And from that comes your attention to others and helping them follow Jesus as well. Lord, I thank you that we have hope in Jesus every day. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Josh, for the good word. He who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And you know, our Lord Jesus Christ, he think of himself not equal as God, and he humble himself. And one day he will be exalted, and every eyes Every, everybody will exalt him and acknowledge him whether you are poor or rich, whether you are old or young, whether you believe him or not. But when you see him high and lifted up, you will say that he is God. Well, that is a wonderful word from Pastor Josh. Now, as we take off the offering today, let us take it as a worship unto God. You know, back to that verse that I shared, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. And here, it says that God knows you. I do not know your financial, financial situation, but here, this is what I know. God knows it. God, and the Bible promised that God will take care of you. And we are called to be set apart. We are called not to just chase the temporal stuff, but the eternal stuff to set our eyes on the things that is above. And we have different calling, but here is one thing that we can all agree with. God has called us to give to give our time, energy, our resources. And here's how you can give of your resource. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And you can give online via the QR code on the screen there, or just go to that website shown on the screen. Now I have a few announcements for us today. First off is 40 Days of Prayer. 40 Days of Prayer is an initiative by Love Singapore, a unity movement of churches in Singapore. And every day, there will be a devotion uh, by a, a pastor from a church in Singapore. I want to encourage you 
to look out for this devotion. It has been a blessing to my spirit, to my soul. Uh, how, this is how you can get this devotion. Go to the social media platform shown on the screen. Follow them and this is where they will drop the devotion daily. Uh, next announcement is by SOC, Serve Our City. And this is where we believe in preaching the gospel, not by just our words, but with our works. And we are bringing families this time, families in the community to gardens by the bay. And we need volunteers to come and serve. And more than just an activity, we want people to interact with them and show the, the, the love of God to this family. It's happening on 20th July, Saturday, 1.30 to 5.30. What do you need? You just need your, we just need your availability and the heart to serve. And that's how you can serve. You scan the QR code over there to register. And last but not least, uh, we have an activity that we organize for the Lion Befrienders in Bendemir. This is for the seniors. So if you want to volunteer and be a blessing to the seniors in this community, you can sign up via the QR code shown on the screen and the dates and time is shown there as well. Don't worry, it will not be physically exhausting because we are working with seniors. So just come and just serve with a big smile to these seniors. Well, that's all the time we have for you today. God bless you and we will see you next week.